Welcome to class. Let's begin right away with our scripture verse as we continue through scripture. We're now in Exodus, Exodus 4, 10 through 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who has made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and will teach thee what thou shalt say. Do you ever feel like, Lord, you're expecting too much of me? I don't have it. I can't do this. If the Lord has put you in these various classes, yes, on your own you may not be able to do it. But you spend that time with the Lord, and you ask Him for His strength and for His help. And you know, your performance may not even measure up to somebody else's, but that doesn't matter. Are you doing your best? Are you doing what the Lord expects? And the help that He has given, are you using it? Moses had to, and so do we. Let's begin class. Now, at the end of the last class, your assignment was to work with modes, the descriptive, the persuasive, narrative, expository, academic, and personal. And you've had some practice with modes. Let's have a little bit more and make it just a little entertaining at the same time. You're going to meet in just a few moments Jace, who is a businessman and doing some writing in a practical sense, out there in the real world, as we call it. His company has asked him to do some writing. And in this particular case, he is struggling with exactly what to write. And in the process, he uses three different modes to kind of come up with what he's going to write. You listen carefully and see if you can determine what those three modes are. Well, here's Jace. Brown is out and green is in. Most of us have noticed our lobby's transformation. The peaceful shades of soft green create an overall sense of relaxation. The curtains swooping to the side to let sunshine in certainly accent the room better than the old Venetian blinds. Hmm. They've all seen the lobby. They don't want to read about it in our newsletter. What about an employee update? Mm -hmm. A date in the life of Craig Nelson. Craig didn't know when he woke up last Thursday that soon he'd be part of the Quincy team. He knew he had to make a good impression for his interview though, so he dressed professionally and ate with care, not wanting to get a coffee stain on his starched white shirt. Consulting the map we'd given him, Craig left his house early, driving into the parking lot 15 minutes before his 10 o'clock interview. During the interview, he showed a passion for our business that impressed our manager, Drake Howell. And he got the job. So be sure to welcome our new employee. Hmm. Still not quite what I want to write about. Employee. What if I explain some of our new changes, our recent changes, such as the lobby area? You might have noticed the modernization of our lobby area. Why the change? Quincy Incorporated is upgrading in order to better serve both our clients and you, our employees. Soon, you will see other changes such as a better break room, better office spaces, and new computers. By making our employees happy, we hope to maintain an atmosphere that creates loyalty and also encourages others to join our team. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. Did you get it? Did you pick them up? What about the brown is out and green is in and then the describing of the lobby? That would be, describing would be, right, descriptive. And, and what about uh, the idea of a day in the life of Craig Nelson? Well, we have narrative as it goes through chronological order, the events, and so forth. And then finally he ends up with the explaining, or should I say maybe informing, about the changes. And that would be what? Well, that would be expository. 
You may even want to, as soon as I'm done telling you this, uh, pause and go back and replay and listen very specifically with those ideas in mind, especially if you didn't pick it up. You do need to know these modes. So we are talking about modes of writing. We're just talking about writing in general, beginning the drafting, and the idea being you need to pick the type of writing that you are going to establish. Now sometimes the topic itself will dictate the type of writing. Other times you need to be a little bit more choosy, or perhaps you're going to choose what you want to do, I want to describe, before you pick actually the topic of what you're going to describe. There's various ways to choose what you're going to do with writing. So be familiar with the modes, you need to know those. And then we talked about the thesis sentence, the main idea of the paragraph in, um, not paragraph, excuse me, of the whole entire work in one statement. Well, let's continue and talk about written works in general. Most of them are going to be essays, some will be report, but just in general. And in all written works, or I will say most written works, because some written works are different, that's fine, you have the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. Now, let's talk about introductory paragraphs. Um, and you should have had some of this before. What do you want to do with an introductory paragraph? Well, you want to catch the reader's attention. That's where the reader is first beginning and you need to hold the reader's attention. You want to introduce the topic, of course. And you want to then draw attention to the main idea. So all that's preliminary to draw attention to the main idea. Be thinking of your introductory paragraph in the idea of an upside down or inverted triangle. You're going to start with some general information. And how do you do that? Well, once you have your thesis, choose some noun in your thesis and start writing information about it. You, don't want, you do not want to go too far back, you want to choose just a noun in the thesis. Then you're going to narrow to specific information about that particular noun. And then eventually you're going to get to your thesis. Now your introductory paragraph needs to be somewhat short. It shouldn't go on and on and on. Oh, unless, of course, your work goes on and on and on and on and on, like a book. But, um, so you want, oh, I would say, three to five sentences, maybe? And you can go over the five, maybe to seven, if you need to. But you don't want to belabor, so to speak, the introductory paragraph. Get right in there. Capture that attention. And then get to your thesis. So again, in the introductory paragraph, the more time you spent planning and thinking about it, the better it will be. All right, so how do you do that? How do you grab the reader's attention and then work on down? What are the various methods you could use? Well, with introductory paragraphs, and this is in your textbook, by the way, you can start with an analogy. You can give a brief anecdote that might take more sentences than three to five, and that's fine. Um, maybe a fact or a statistic, something that will grab attention. You can start with a question, although generally that's not my favorite. I think that leaves too many things open. Or you can start with some kind of a quotation. Any of those will work. Now, let's just keep in mind, too, that the major part of your written works are made up of paper, of paragraphs, excuse me, of paragraphs. So you have your thesis, which is your main idea for your entire work, and what are the various parts of the paragraph? Well, you have, of course, your topic sentence. That is your main idea. Most times it's first in the paragraph, but not always. And then you're going to go to your supporting sentences that will give information that proves the topic sentence. And then not all paragraphs, but a lot of paragraphs have one concluding sentence. Let's look at a couple of examples that I want to show you. And what I mean by examples is the idea of what's the difference between the thesis and the topic? Yes, I know we talked about whole work versus paragraph, but let's just think a little bit more clearly on that. All right, is hydrogen oxygen? They are both elements. No, they are not. Okay, there's a difference there. Two plus two equals four. That's entirely correct. What if I say two plus negative two? That is no longer four. That is now zero. Therefore, just as these little differences are not the same, a thesis statement is, guess what, not the topic statement. All right? Your thesis statement, your whole entire work, your topic sentence for your one paragraph. Let's do, oh, again, you can do this to particular practice. Pause the program right now and do Use the Skill 1.3 on page 12. What was your answer? Well, let's look and see if yours is similar. By the way, that is a picture, actual picture, of Alexander Dumas, who was the writer of 
The Three Musketeers and other adventure books. Alexander Dumas was a famous writer of the 19th century. Or you might have chosen something differently. Uh, maybe you didn't focus on the 19th century. Maybe you focused on his adventure writings and you said uh, he was a famous adventure writer. Or you might have said uh, Dumas who wrote of many historical things. And he did. He took many historical things isn't a good word. You know that. But <laughs> events maybe. Um, took many historical occasions and events and developed entire fiction stories about them. So just make sure though that when you're looking at the paragraph you find out what the main idea is. And by the way, if one of the details of the paragraph you're writing doesn't seem to fit all the rest of them, take that one out. Doesn't mean you'll never use it, it just doesn't fit in this paragraph. So work with that idea. Let me show you though how thesis, a thesis statement and topic statements do relate. I know we talked about their differences, but they are there for a reason. Let me give you some structure on that one. You have your thesis sentence, which is for the entire work. And they are supported, your thesis sentence is supported by the topic sentences of the paragraph. The topic sentences of the paragraph should directly relate to some aspect of the thesis sentence. If it doesn't, throw it out. It needs to relate. And then in the paragraphs, you have supporting sentences that do as they are called. Support or gives facts for the topic sentence. All of them together work to support the entire thesis sentence. But guess what? When you have a thesis statement, you can take the topic sentence and it can become the main, the main topic sentences can become the main points of your outline. Actually, you need to work that one backwards. You need to be doing your research or thinking through and here's your thesis sentence and then I'm going to have if you're doing an essay, it's very easy to have three major points because then they can each become the major paragraphs in the body of your paper. So you have these, these major points and you put them as Roman numerals one, two, and three. And then you make them into a sentence for a sentence outline and guess what? They then become the topic sentences and you develop a paragraph around them. And it's easy. You think through your planning and you get your basic supports in line and keep developing it and you kind of put some flesh on your skeleton, so to speak. Well, let me show you what I mean. You go to your thesis sentence, you have that, you had your topic sentences. Then under your topic sentences, you come up with support. Make them full sentences and you've got supporting sentences. You can do a topic two, the supporting sentences, topic three, also supporting sentences. So you have your skeleton outline, so to speak, add some more flesh, make it into a body or a work. So you have the body of your written work. By the way, as a little interest aside here, I'm taking this class right now that talks about writing and I found out that it was Plato over 2,000 years ago who actually started the metaphor of referring to a written work as a body. Isn't that interesting? And to this day we still talk about the body of writing and we use a lot of different metaphors like filling out the skeleton outline. Very, very interesting. Writing does come together and you know, use it, learn the little tidbits and lock in your learning from the literary sense and from the writing sense and from the grammar sense and from the historical sense. Put it all together and use it and become a more intelligent person because of it. Well, let's continue to move on on this one. Now I want you to look at another chart in your textbook. This is on page 12 and you have a developmental strategy chart, okay? How do you develop your paragraphs? Comparison contrast, example, fact, incident or anecdote, quotation, and here are the definitions of course, reasons, sensory details, statistics, or visual aid. I want you very much to study this chart, or maybe I should change that a little bit and say I want you to study this chart very, very much. You do need to know it. You need to know it for upcoming quizzes, hint, hint. You need to know it for tests. You need to know it for personal writing and that's why I'm making you learning it, learn it now because as we get through the next 12 chapters and you have to do writing, you need to use these and you need to be aware of what you're using. You can't just write and say, oh, whatever happens, whatever comes out, that's what I did. You plan. You have to plan. Right? You don't create something. Are you, you know, do you like to build things? You don't build something by saying, okay, here's all my materials, I'm going to throw it together and whatever comes out, it is. What about you taking a trip? You don't know exactly where you're going, but here's where you are and here's your destination. You just kind of start and you say wherever I end up is where I end up. No, you plan. You plan the beginning, you plan the end, 
and how to get there. Same do with writing. Yes, it takes some time, but it's worth the effort. So you look at these to do a comparison contrast. You know, here's the ways th these two topics are alike, these two topics are different. What about sensory details, as in descriptive writing? What about the use of quotations and statistics to s develop or support your paragraphs? Facts, reasons, reasons why something is whatever. Are you trying to persuade? Why? Why should somebody do such and such? Know these differences. You need to know them very well. Let's do a little practice. You might now, right now, might want to pause and look over these definitions on page 12, or maybe you want to kind of pause while we're doing this practice together. But I'm going to expect you to try this, to just not let me tell you the answers. You try, you practice as we go through this particular exercise. It's not in your textbook, it's just one you'll know how to do together. And it has to do with one of my favorite authors, Alexander Dumas. I love his The Man in the Iron Mast and The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers and all the heroes and adventures of all of those. So I've created some sentences that I'm going to ask you what would be a good way or the best way to develop each of these topic sentences. The topic sentences themselves lend, them, lend to what type of development based on the chart on page 12. Are you ready? Okay. All right, let's try this one. Let's say the thesis of the entire work is the works of Alexander Dumas are exciting adventures. Kind of bland, but it opens up what we want to do. Now, this is perhaps my first topic sentence. The Count of Monte Cristo involves an ordinary man, whereas the man in the iron mask involves two princes. What is that? What type of development? Yes, I'm doing comparison contrast. See the whereas there? That's a big idea. And then we have the big clue, I may say. And we have the two ideas that we are comparing and, in this case, contrasting. Try this one. Edmond Dantes escapes from a prison fortress after spending 14 years there for a crime he did not commit. Okay, uh, remember the thesis has to do with adventures. So what is this? Well, I'm going to go on and talk about the, ex this is an example of adventures. What about this one? Dantes discovers a huge treasure, and in this case, the writer then elaborates. So we are discussing the incident or the anecdote of his discovering that treasure, which is a small portion of that book. Let's try this one. Da Dante's had been flung into the sea and was dragged into its depth by a 36-pound shot tied to his feet. The sea is the cemetery of the Chateau d'If. Oh, well, that should give it away, right? We're doing a quotation. The quotation marks helped you on that one, I'm sure. What about this one? Dumas wants to enthrall his readers, so he creates a tale complete with injustice and buried treasure. Notice the clue word so. He wants to enthrall so. I'm having a why. I'm having a reason. What about this one? I think you'll get it. Um, it is a quotation, but that's not what I want you to focus on here, okay? The island was deserted, and the sun seemed to cover it with its fiery glance. Afar off, a few small fishing boats studded the blue ocean. Oh, I'm definitely using, or in this case Dumas is, sensory details. And let's look at this final one. Eighty-five percent of all those who read The Count of Monte Cristo are captivated by its thrilling adventures. I have a statistic and hopefully I can prove that one. All right, right now I'd like you to do your own practice. Pause the program and do practice the skill 1.4, page 13. So did you come up with a developmental strategy? Well, of course you did. You're just waiting, just waiting and anxiously waiting for me to say your answer was right. Let's look and see. It was the example. I hope you got that one. Well, let's try another one. Pause the program and do review the skill 1.5 on that same page. Let's check and see what you came up with. You could either come up with fact or reasons for this particular one. Well, let's you and I continue and talk about conclusions. The concluding sentence of a paragraph. It needs to do several things. Summarize the one main idea or it 
it doesn't have to do all of these, it can do one or the other. Or it can give a solution to a problem or a persuasion idea. It can ask a question or it can make a prediction. Let me tell you right now that I feel like the use of the questions are not always as powerful. So save those and use those rarely. Use them when they really, really work. Now, every work needs a conclusion. And paragraphs, paragraphs, having a concluding sentence does help it wrap up, even though the concluding sentence is not as absolutely necessary as the conclusion for a whole entire work. So keep that in mind and realize that we are doing something. Take this information having to do with ending paragraphs and transfer it to the idea of a whole entire paper. You know, if, you're, if there's a problem, give a solution or make a prediction or draw to the idea of the reader having to make a decision or s at least do a summary. That's the least you can do with it. And, and don't make it an obvious summary. Uh, your readers generally aren't going to be dumb, so they're not going to be like, I need to rehear this again. Kind of make it a subtle little drawing together of things. Right now, I would like you to pause the program and do use the skill 1.6 on page 14 and work with that concluding sentence. So you read that nice, enjoyable paragraph and you have to have, wrap it up. It needs a final wrap it up. It may feel like the grandfather carrying him off to bed does, but you know, what else can we say? Well, we could say something like, each child sad, sailed quietly off into his own dreamy world filled with high seas adventure. Yours might have been a little different than that, but that's okay. That's just fine. Let's move on by pulling this whole idea of the thesis and the topic sentences and all that together in looking at one essay. So right now, you pause the program, locate your book two, which your parent might have, and do Teaching Help One on page 31. Spend time with that one and then come back and join me. I hope the locating of the various sentences in this activity was somewhat easy for you. Let's go ahead and check the answers. Do you have your sheet or book with you? Well, let's begin on this one, okay? Now, you had to find the thesis sentence, which conveniently is where it's supposed to be. It's the last sentence in the introductory paragraph, and then your topic sentences. And guess what? They are at the beginning of the various paragraphs. The nice transition words, first, second, third, keep us going and keep us reminded that we're talking about the benefits. What benefits? Well, first this one, then that one. We're drawing connections. Now, did you find the restatement of the thesis? Yes. Now, this one is a little differently than, different than what I teach before, and that is the idea that it's at the end of the concluding paragraph. So, we have talked about thesis, we, thesis statements. We've talked about um, types of writing. We've talked about th topic sentences. And then as we narrow the field and continue to talk about paragraphs, we talked about developmental strategies. You know, the comparison, contrast, the descriptive, and all that. And I am expecting you to spend more time on that chart and learn those, all right? So now let's just take it a step farther and talk about the organization of paragraphs. If you're going to plan, you need to plan well. Now, if you're doing a developmental strategy of comparison contrast, then pretty much your, develop, your organizational strategy is going to be comparison contrast, even though there's a couple ways in comparison contrast that you can develop things. But they don't always match up that easily. So let's go ahead right now and look in your textbook on page 14 and look at your paragraph organization chart. Okay. So what are your methods? Chronological order, first to last, that's nice and easy. Spatial order, that would be describing a place. And here's your definitions and used most in. Then you have order of importance. That has to do a lot with reasons, why. You have cause and effect order and you have contrast and comparison or comparison and contrast. Those are the various types of orders. Let's talk more specifically. I'll spend a little bit more time with these. All right, let's begin. Let's talk about the chronological time period. That's nice and easy. You know that one. That's simply a matter of timing. Let's look in your text. On page 15, there's an example paragraph having to do with chronological order and it has to do with Colin Powell. And look at the dates. Can you see the dates? Well, at least in your textbook you can. That's very helpful. It gives the idea of first this, then this, then this. 
I'm not going to spend much time with chronological, you understand that we're going to move on. What's the second idea? The second idea has to do with spatial, and that is describing a place. There's an excellent example of this in your textbook. Now, you're going to listen while I read it. So you watch here while I read this and you see the spatial description. The young pastor walked through the center of the double doors that led into the auditorium. Before him stretched a blue carpeted aisle that led to the platform where the white wooden pulpit stood. On the left side of the platform was the grand piano and to the right was a large electric organ. Several feet behind the pulpit, 48 blue upholstered chairs filled the choir chancel. His eyes looked beyond the chancel to the baptismal pool. The young pastor then observed the rest of the room. On either side of the auditorium were matching stained glass windows that allowed some sunlight to brighten the room. Overhead track lighting and chandeliers provided more light. Twenty rows of white wooden pews with blue upholstered seats were grouped in four sections around the auditorium. As the young pastor assimilated what he saw, he prayed that he would be able to administer to those who would sit in this auditorium. Now, I provided that visual to help you see the idea of describing spatially, but the idea is for the reader to be able to get that from the words, which I think this particular paragraph does a good job. And I'm sure you noticed the clues. With chronological order, you have first, second, at this time, earlier. With spatial, it's to the right, to the left, those type of things. And there is a third order, of course, and that would have to do with the order of importance. So let's do a little practice right now, all right? You pause the program and you read the indented paragraph at the top of page 16 and you see if you can find the reasons. Write them down or mark them in your book. Now hang on, I'll go over that in a minute. But another thing for you to do. Pause the program and identify the topic sentence and the concluding sentence in that particular paragraph. Good. Hang on to that for a minute and let's do one more thing here. What is the order in this particular paragraph? We're having to do with the order of importance. Is it least to most or most to least? If you need to pause right now and look and check that out, do that because I want you to have all of those answers. Great, you did that. Oh, let's take a little time and go over some of that. So, what is the topic sentence in this paragraph? You should have the idea of in the 1760s and 1770s, the emergence of the term American reflected a spirit of nationalism among the colonists. As you continue, you'll see that. What's the concluding sentence? Well, that is then, these newly named Americans possessed confidence in their role in the New World. Now you found the topic sentence and the concluding sentence. Let's talk about what actually is some of the order in this order of importance paragraph. It begins with geographical separation, moves to opportunity to own property, then to diverse backgrounds, and ends with self-government. You, you were not required to pick all those out, but I hope you, those are familiar to you at least. I did ask you what is the order, and of course you should have chosen least to most. Why? Well, there was a big clue there at the end. Do you remember that particular clue? As we get to the last of the orders, it talks about one of the most important, or whatever, so we have most. That's a big clue to let you know that it's going from the least to the most important. Well, we've covered a lot of information about writing not, and paragraphing and thesis sentence, and I hope you're learning all of this and working through all of this at the same time. Now, you will have two particular ideas to do with your assignment. You'll need a little bit more on this time for the assignment, but I need you to take the time and do both of these well. Your assignments, of course, the first one is to do sheet 1B, parts A and B. That'll take you a little time, but do it well. And I want you to study the terms and the charts from pages 10 through 14 for our quiz. Notice those purple charts, know the terms and definitions.